All right, we are live with Chef Benny from Rome, where he is uh, currently uh, talking to us from. You can see the, the proud flag of Italy in the background. We are not only discovering Italian cuisine, but we are also celebrating the victory of Italy in the Euro Cup yesterday. I would have rooted yep. for France if they were playing, but they didn't make it to the final. So <laughs> I was definitely rooting for Italy yesterday. No offense to the uh, to the the English people on the call, but uh, yes, I I was rooting for Italy. I admit it was a great game. So uh, congratulations again on the on the victory. We'll see you in the World Cup next year, and that time I will root for France. <laughs> but uh, but congratulations again for Italia. <laughs> Grazie, thank you. E ciao a tutti, Forza Italia. We waited 53 years for this celebration. It was very important to us, and, you know, especially after over one and a half year of a COVID pandemic, and it was the first time that the Italian people get back together. It was not only a sports celebration, it was a celebration of life, and we celebrated until early this morning. You know, the game ended up uh, uh, midnight last night, but until three or four in the morning, we had fireworks, uh, car carousel. It was insane. It was a beautiful celebration. Today, the team came, the president uh, celebrated on the Quirinale with them, give them the honor. So we are very, very proud. And you know what it means in Italy when you have a celebration, right? Absolutely. You eat even more. <laughs> so we got we eat even more, we drink even more. And to start celebrating, you know, we cannot start without something to drink. And I got this special for the celebration is the Peroni Grand Reserva they made to celebrate Italy today, you know, and we also have the special cup for the celebration. So allow me to cheers to the victory. Because, you know, like we said in Italy, when you drink on the work, you're more productive. So Absolutely. Something the Americans should learn, I guess, right? <laughs> I should have yes. prepared my uh, limoncello. I don't have it with me, but it's in my in my cabinet. Maybe I'll, I'll bring it for the end. It's still a little yeah, early that's here. That's great. <laughs> and you know, here it's, uh, right now it's 7.30 p.m. So perhaps uh, in your area it's more brunch time, but here it's almost dinner time. It's a good aperitif to have some beer, wine and uh, have some product later. Perfect, so thanks again for uh, waking up for us <laughs> and uh, to talk to us from Rome, it, uh, Italy, where you are right now, but for people who don't know you, um, Chef Benny is actually um, an award-winning chef, um, been doing a lot of different things that he'll talk to us about. Uh, we had, we really had the, the chance of having Chef Benny as part of the 196 Flavors team since 2015, actually, he was one of the very first, if not the first, chef to join uh, the team of experts to validate all of our research and I uh, and our recipes very thoroughly, I have to admit, um, because, you know, sometimes there's omissions and, and slight mistakes, but we all make mistakes. But um, we, we are really, really, really excited about having uh, Chef Benny on the team and really making sure that whatever we talk about in terms of Italian cuisine is thoroughly validated and, and um, we have the, the credibility and authority of Chef Benny behind it. I would say that Italian cuisine is probably one of the most bastardized cuisine in the world. Uh, there's a lot of things that are said out there, especially in the US, about authentic and traditional cuisine. And it is our job at 196 Flavors to make sure that um, when we talk about any cuisine, especially Italian cuisine, we um, represent the true authentic and traditional cuisine of this beautiful country that, that I love. Um, so Chevenny, maybe if you want to start by introducing yourself to the people on the call and telling us about um, about you and what you've been doing. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure. You know, it's the last day of vacation, technically, for me, going back to work officially tomorrow. I thought the remotely work until I travel again on Friday, but uh, it's the last day of enjoyment for me. And it's great to be here the day after the victory. It's great that we can do and talk about Italian cuisine from my hometown, my home here in Rome. So we're going to talk a little bit and explain what's the difference. I always say, you know, the Italian is known as the bel paese, and everyone recalls the spaghetti, pizza, mandolino. But there is so much more to that, you know. And wherever you go in every town, you have a different cuisine. You have a regional cuisine. We have 20 regions, but every region is breakdown down in 
uh, sub-regions and cities. And there is what is called Campanellismo here. You know, when in starting in the Middle Age, you have the tower of your church, who has the tallest one. You know, it's the same with the cuisine. Who has the best cuisine? Who has the best dish? Who has the best cheese? So everyone argue, you know, it's never ending, just like an Italian family at Christmas or a Sunday by grandmas, you know, it's all made by food, drinks and argument. And that's the fun part that you have to argue. And the discover authentic Italian cuisine, it's a little bit complicated. And if any one of you follow Mike's blog, you know, he's known as the devil of the kitchen, but I can tell you I'm his pain in the neck because sometimes I crash down his dreams that he does such a wonderful research and then in the end I say, well, it's a little bit different or things like that. I always uh, want to make sure we put out the authenticity in this because uh, just like Mike mentioned, you know, unfortunately Italian cuisine has been uh, globalized so much outside Italy because uh, the first rule of Italian cuisine, you cannot make Italian food without Italian product. And those products are so difficult to find. It's true now with the, uh, we have more brand outside Italy that you can find in the US, in France, in Japan, in Australia. But unfortunately, we have so many Italian sounding brands with products that they say Italian, but they're not Italian. And you can see the difference of the tomatoes, of the oil, of the salt, that's the base of what we make. And remember, one very important things about Italian cuisine, we use sea salt here. And the sea salt has a more powerful flavor. It is not that saltiness, but it enhances the flavor on the food and develop that umami, which is inside each product. And that's yet you know it's very different from utilize a kosher salt or iodized salt or, or the now very trendy Himalayan salt. Each salt has a different uh, uh, utilizing. It's the same for the oil. You know, we have the extra virgin olive oil that's uh, our base for 99% if we do Mediterranean diet. You know, we can split uh, the Italian cuisine perhaps in three basic geographic regions. We have the coastal and the island based on the Mediterranean diet. So all those wonderful produce from the land and mother nature give us the tomatoes, the garlic, the onions, and the original oil, the herbs. Then we've got Northern cuisine, it's a little bit more earthy, butter base, a little bit more soup and the risotto because we have the big Veneto land with one of the best rice in the world, many rice varieties many corn varieties, more root vegetables and legume over there. Then you have the center in the south, which is blend a little bit within in, uh, 60, 80 kilometers, you have coast and mountain and land in between. So you have more vegetables, you have more leafy vegetables, more seasonal and different kind of meat. And when I say meat, I'm not talking the beef, pork and chicken. We talk about uh, eating wild boar. We talk about rabbit, hare, deer, donkey, horse. Yes, we eat that and they're delicious and they're very, very healthy. And mutton and pheasant and duck and geese. And we have a sub version of those. We have so many of those wonderful birds and game. That's just amazing. You know, I remember growing up my grandparents, after World War II, they were deported to Rome and then they escaped the Nazis, you know, and they sat on the countryside of Rome. And then they were in this small town, original Esperia, which was destroyed during World War II. And they were so lucky they'd been saved technically by the Nazis because two days before the town being destroyed by the French Moroccan troops, the Gumier that raped and killed everybody there, they were deported to Rome. And that saved their life and made me here today because see my dad and everything else. So once they set off the World War II in Rome, they had their farm, they had their food shacks, they start to work so like restaurant and the grocery store and produce from the land and deliver to the main restaurant in downtown, the jail, 
and uh, all the wonderful places that they tried. So that is very important to know, you know, that everything has a story behind. And uh, story is connected to history. And right now, you know, many likes to cancel or forget about that, but we have to learn from what history was. And it's the only that's way good. that we can That's what Italy made this today. I mean, Italy as a, country, as a unified country is fairly recent. It's only a couple, yeah. you know, less than a couple centuries old. So that's the reason why there's so much diversity in the in the, the regional cuisines, and as you explained, you know, between the northern cuisine, the southern cuisine, and the coastal, which is kind of an overlay on top of the northern and and uh, southern, which kind of unifies everything with coastal and and island um, island cuisine. You mentioned about the different types of meat, and there's another thing I wanted to add is. Not only do you guys have probably more variety in terms of the types of animals that you, you incorporate into your cuisine, but you also use a lot of different parts of the animals that may not be very, um, you know, very, um, like right now, a lot of people are just stick to like the traditional cuts of meat, but you guys make use of almost every single part of the animal. <laughs> Well, technically, yes, you know, usually the butcher breaks down the animal in four parts, so anterior and posterior parts, you know, in quarters. But in Rome and Italy and Toscan in Central Italy, especially, you know, we have the fifth quarter. Everything was discarded, became part of our culinary tradition, part of our gastronomy, you know, the offal, the tail, the the ears, the brain, the nose, the snout, uh, uh, everything can be used. And we made so many delicious, you know, the Coda Vaccinara, the Oxtail Roman style, and the Florentine tribe, and the chicken feet uh, uh, sauce, you know, that is something wonderful. You know, if you go now to see an Italian restaurant outside Italy, you always find those five, four, same, dishes they're not even authentic anymore like who makes spaghetti meatballs we don't have here <laughs> i tell you some tourists go places now or fettuccine alfredo you know they're not what people know because fettuccine alfredo were born by alfredo aloscrofa you know he made the fettuccine for his pregnant wife and it was with this double triple butter sauce that you melt and then you add the water and then you mix and you blend with more butter and the cheese to make a rich and creamy no milk no cream nothing else added no garlic absolutely not but many don't even know that the kind of pasta was different because the restaurants were all men working so and men have a warmer palm warmer hands so the pasta always got very hard when we're making the fresh pasta so they start to make the pasta only with the fresh flour and egg yolks that helped the pasta to be more porous and uh, uh, hold better on the cooking and then blend better with the sauce which is very different if you go northern italy which in emilia or emilia romagna they are famous for their fresh egg pasta it's made with all eggs and it's very different from the one we do down here talking about this i want to make a myth for a lot of people out there because i keep hearing it you do not <laughs> add oil to the water when you cook pasta for the simple reason no. that it does not the sauce does not um you know adhere to the uh, stick to the pasta when you add oil it makes it more you know slippery and it does yeah. it, it defeats the purpose and i keep hearing from yeah. people you know, who think that they know about Italian cuisine, that that's the way to make no. it, it's not. And the water has to be very, very boiling, and you add the salt just a few seconds before add the, the pasta. And that's the other trick. So and you only cook the pasta for three quarters of the time, because even on the package or your fresh made pasta, you know, say al dente in seven minutes, you will cook for four minutes in there and then you finish with the sauce because it will blend better and uh, we call callosa not colosa you want uh, your pasta to be smooth and silky not sticky and gooey so that's the very difference and that's important to note when you said about seven minutes and four minutes especially when you have dishes that you finish uh, maybe in a skillet with some sauce it's going to continue cooking for maybe two or three minutes so you want to All incorporate right. the time in the overall cooking time yeah that might not apply on cold sauce. If something's an authentic pesto sauce or a cold base sauce, so then you want to 
uh, just leave a minute or so before the actual cooking time and then rest because that will still finish. But when you still cook uh, on the skillet, because uh, remember, we don't just toast the sauce uh, with that. We really keep cooking and we blend. We call the mantecatura. You know, when you manteca, you know, many don't understand. It's not just adding cheese or extra seasoning in the end is uh, incorporated the air and mixing when you toss the pasta with the sauce in the skillet so that what really makes the sauce different that will go around the pasta it can be a long pasta like spaghetti vermicelli bucatini or a more short pasta like bombolotti rigatoni schiaffoni penne so it really makes that and you will see in many preparation that we also had water or pasta water to that we do not add other chicken stock or vegetarian stock to the pasta sauce because we want uh, if something tastes like clams you want to taste like clams not like uh, chicken broth where your clams taste like chicken no we don't do that so the the what people need to understand is do not throw away your cooking water keep it because you're going to need it at some point when you finish the, the most pasta dishes. The other thing I wanted nope. to come back to is when you talk about salt, it's interesting because yes, I totally agree with the fact that, you know, that you need to use sea salt and it, it can add some, some of this umami flavor, which a lot of people compensate with Parmesan because Parmesan is one of those products that, that typically adds uh, this uh, umami flavor. Unfortunately, Parmesan is not used in all Italian dishes or Italian pasta dishes. Um, you know, especially when, when you talk about northern and southern no. cuisine, it's not authentic. But we do tend to compensate um, by adding parmesan to everything. <laughs> so that's another thing. Correct. That, and you know, in the mantecatura, stuff. when you finish the mixing, you add some of the cheese. You know, sometimes it can be a pecorino, sometimes it can be a parmigiano reggiano, can be a blend of that, can be a siago, depending on what the recipe calls. Some recipes do not call for cheese at all, not in the sauce, because that's another thing, you know, in many recipes, the cheese is included because as I mentioned, you know, you make the creaminess sauce, tossing with the fresh air and incorporate in that. And then if you really want to have an Italian waiter or chef to be your enemy, when you order pasta with clams or fish, ask for the Parmesan cheese and then see what they're gonna tell you, you know? We used to have, you know, before TripAdvice or things like this, we were allowed to kick the clients out, which we didn't like it. You know, when they would ask you, oh, I want cream on that or I want cheese. Now you can't do that anymore, but it was much better for us to keep our tradition in that way. We were talking about that last week when uh, I was uh, preparing with Chef Benny and we were talking about, the I mean, I'm not uh, a chef myself and I don't have a restaurant, but if I was a chef in a restaurant, that that would really tick me off. I mean, if people were changing the way that their dishes are, are represented and um, substitution yeah. and so on, it, it, it's not the greatest thing for chefs. I mean, you want to you want people to enjoy your food and the food that you're making. And if you don't like anything on the menu, maybe the best thing to do is to go to another restaurant, is my, is my opinion. Um, the, uh, there's a yeah. lot of, um, you know, in the US, there's a lot of things that you mentioned that are being done and are being thought as authentic Italian, especially because there's been a huge immigration of, of Italians in the, you know, beginning of the last century and, uh, end of, uh, 1800. And of course, um, with that came a lot, the evolution of Italian cuisine in the US, which is almost like a different cuisine. American Italian cuisine is to me is almost like it a is it is different, you know, as the same roots. But I always say the American Italian cuisine, it, it is its own culture, its own value, and certain dishes are amazing. I love them. You know, it's when they want to do certain things, they are not authentic Italian. So for authentic, that it's what. Uh, I don't like, but what to say flavor wise, many are great. You know, wherever you go, each town, each nation, you always find good food. It's a very, you know, almost never found a place that is, they say, oh, I don't like the food. You know, I don't like the smoked herring. So a couple of times end up in town that is, but that was me, okay. But I'll say, you know, that was it. But it is the same evolution about talking about the food. You know, when I was in my grandma's, 
on the Sunday, uh, lunch and the holidays, there was one food for everybody. Now when I visit some relatives or friends, you know, three kids, all three get different food. Maybe the mom go and buy fast food for them and then make two other different kind of food for the older part of the family and the younger one. I don't understand that. And that's so much work and waste and you lose the tradition. It's nice to have the meal all together for respect all the same meal. And you know, the old Italian mom saying, man just eat it, eat and shut up. Yeah. You know, otherwise that's the window where you can jump off there. Absolutely. The other thing that's I the way to... we grow up. That, that's one thing I wanted to go back to also is when you talk about the, the fact that you have to make Italian food and Italian cuisine with real in, Italian ingredients. And that's especially true because when you look at most of the recipes, not all of them, a lot of the recipes have three, four, five ingredients max. And it, so it, it's obviously all about the ingredients themselves. I would say even more so than the technique, even though the technique is important. But if you don't really have the good, authentic ingredients to begin with, you can't really make Italian cuisine. Yeah, I don't know if the birds are annoy you. I'm sorry, I want to show you because it's the sunset is coming out. You can see just 20 minutes away is downtown Rome. We're in the residential area uh, here in Rome, and I have all these birds that it's their holy time now when it's the sunset. They like to come out and sing and chirp and go around. So for people who are doubting, Chevigny is actually in Roma. Um, so Chevigny yeah. actually lives in the U.S. Uh, in Wisconsin. You, 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 I don't think you mentioned that. That um, you know, it lives in the U.S., but he happens to be in in Rome, in Italy, for for the holidays. So yeah, he's actually in Roma. Uh, one yeah. thing I wanted to talk about since uh, since we talked about American Italian cuisine is the evolution of Italian and Roman cuisine as well. With Italian cuisine starting with ancient Rome, ancient Roman style, then the Renaissance. Yeah and then traditional modern, especially with the introduction of ingredients like tomatoes, corn, or peppers. And if you can talk to All us right. about this evolution. If you think of the Italian cuisine right now, the first ingredient that comes in mind to everybody is tomato and tomato sauce. And I think that's our uh, primary ingredient, which it is nowadays, but tomatoes come from the Americas. And until Columbus discovered the Americas and they start to import the tomatoes, in the 16th centuries, we did not use them. In the beginning, also, the tomatoes were thinking, you know, they are fruit technically, because they are catalyzed as fruit. They were eaten in the wrong way when they were not ripe. So and now we have so many different kinds of tomatoes. And actually, I have this one from our garden, which is not a San Marzano, but it's called the Oblungo. And uh, might recall a San Marzano or a Roma in the United States, but the smell, it's amazing. And this is what we usually do only for a salad, because this is great to be uh, eaten raw. Then we have the round tomatoes with the Casalino, they have all the little stripes. They are better when they're cooked, you know? And that is also, you need to know your ingredients. And we have so many varieties, you know? And sometimes when they ask me, how many tomatoes do you have in Italy? Who knows? You know, and it's so boring if I tell you 10,222. I don't know. It's just so beautiful. That we have so many that it will take a lifetime to discover and savor each one. It's the same for the potatoes and everything. And obviously, you know, ancient Roman cuisine was already stable at, at the time. You know, wild boar, rabbit, items like that. We already eat nowadays and we kind of follow the tradition, you know, the Roman gnocchi, when potatoes were not in Italy, were made just with the flour, you know, and were cooked on the stone and served with the honey and the pepper. And there was a little bit of cheese, so the sharp pecorino style cheese, something resembled the pecorino, not the actual pecorino, but it's that. You know, and one great uh, ingredient at the time of Rome was the garum, also known as aliquamen, which was a fermented uh, anchovy base sauce, which is not fish sauce. Many say, oh, it's just like fish sauce. It is not. It's very pungent. Less pungent, I will say, of the fish sauce, but very full of flavor. And that was utilized as a condiment in many dishes because salt at the time of Rome was not an ingredient. It was money. You know why we call it salary? 
because comes from Salario. Via Salaria is one of the ancient uh, streets in Rome that from the sea coast comes to Rome and they will bring all the salt from the Saline and uh, the legionnaire were paid in salt at the time. So there's lots of history that evolved. We, and before Romans, probably... we have the Etruscan. And that, uh, we don't have that much information about Etruscan cuisine, but we know that especially eat vegetables, especially artichoke, arugula, and uh, kale, things like that. So I make uh, uh, lots of sauce with that. So that's another one. And through the history, Southern Italy had lots of uh, foreign influence. Imagine like in uh, Sicily and Puglia, they had the Norman, they had the Ottoman, they had all the Arab, they had the Slovan, you know, the Viking. It was a really melting pot also of flavor and the multiplicity. Many do not realize that, you know, and that's another big difference with other cuisine that we incorporate all this tradition into our dishes. One of the most famous dishes in Sicily is the couscous. And obviously couscous of Arab origin, but became such a fundamental part of the Sicilian cuisine. We were talking also about Sardinia, um, and there's actually a new Sardinian restaurant here in LA that I went to a couple of times that I, and I didn't know about Sardinian cuisine, but they use a lot of saffron. But you were mentioning to me that it's not just in Sardinia, but there's, uh, I think in the Bruzzo region, is um, really, yeah. really, really known for the saffron production. Yeah, they do great saffron production. They're famous for also, they make saffron cookies there, saffron panna cotta. And then obviously the most popular uh, dish in Lombardia or Milan is the risotto la Milanese, which is a saffron-based risotto. And use the butter from the local Lombardia, the rice provided from the Valpadana and the saffron that comes from Abruzzi. You know, all these ingredients and product that blend together and they are amazing, you know. Then if someone wanted to elevate that, you know, the great Italian chef, Guartiero Marchesi, many, many years ago, invented this famous risotto e oro. He started to put edible leaves of uh, gold on top of the risotto la milanese to make it war for the king. So I'm going to uh, do a pause here. Um, I will ask everybody if you have any question and you're um, uh, attending the, um, the live with uh, either from Facebook or from YouTube, you can actually add comments to either of the channels and ask questions to Chef Benny. Uh, we're going to start with one question from David. Um, I love limoncello. I do too. Uh, how can it be incorporated into Italian cuisine? So this is very, very difficult. So listen carefully. You take the bottle of limoncello, make sure it's chilled, get a glass next to you. And every time you do a mistake, you drink limoncello. Okay, that's the best way to incorporate the limoncello in your body in Italian cuisine. It is uh, great as digestive or for aperitif. It's not the great to cook. It's very challenging, but you can make sorbet or gelato with the limoncello and that is great and i did actually enjoy the do marinated the bacala with limoncello it is particular not for everybody but yeah just enjoy the limoncello drinking yeah it's very sweet of course uh you know i love it myself but yeah i haven't really tried to incorporate in uh into uh but i have tried limoncello gelato and it's absolutely good um, if you have any question again, feel free to uh, post them to comment. We'll, we'll uh, answer them as we go. So I want to open a can of worms and um, I want to start talking about pizza. I'm, I am a, a, a foodie myself, of course, uh, but there's one thing that I'm very, very particular about. It's pizza. I, can, I call myself a pizza snob, snob and there's uh, not that many places, especially here in the US, especially in Los Angeles, where you can find authentic Italian pizza. I can mention like two or three names, but most places, um, although the, the pizza might be good, uh, is not what I would call authentic uh, Italian pizza. And obviously there's different ways to make authentic pizza, whether you talk about Napolitan and so on. And that's what I wanted to talk um, to you, Chef Benny, about, uh, you know, what makes authentic pizza. And obviously there's gonna be differences depending on the region. The one thing I would say is uh, pineapple does not belong to the pizza. That's the kind of worms I wanted to open. <laughs> Absolutely. 
No pineapple. We do not do that. That's a crime against humanity. However, other topping that are popular in other countries, they don't go on Italian pizza, such as uh, like chicken or things like that, Alfredo sauce, you know. Well, usually the base of pizza can be a white pizza. And when we say white, it's only cheese or like a focaccia with a brush of uh, extra virgin olive oil or always with the tomatoes. And when we do, we don't have such a thing as a pizza sauce. You only use uh, raw crushed tomatoes or raw tomato sauce that you made with your pelati or the fresh tomato squeeze or just chopped uh, fresh tomatoes. And even for the pizza, we said, from region to region, they change. You know, the most famous in the world is the pizza napoletana, and you use very high gluten uh, flour, beautiful natural leaven. Uh, sometimes can be used uh, beer yeast, but the leaven is the real part. And usually you have a longer levitation. But also, many don't know, like the pizza is two different kind of levitation the first actor you call maturation because the pizza dough has to mature as to start its own fermentation then you blend with the rest and one of the trick you never add the salt on the same time you use the natural leaven otherwise it will kill the natural leaven and the pizza napoletana it's famous it's so airy so fluffy it'll be more chewy it's cooked at very high temperature and it's very thin in the middle and you have this nice beautiful fluffy crown that is there you know and you buy through and it's not stuffed it's just full of hair it's beautiful then you have the roman pizza that we this will be more like bread it's very very thin crust and you just cook in the oven at 900 to 1000 fahrenheit degrees you know it has to be like 525 600 celsius too and it comes a little bit of charcoal on the side that gives that umami flavor uh, the dough, some things it's a little raw. It's not real. It's only need to be uh, secretized in the moment, you know, and you can just have the nice crunch and bite. And then if you go, you have the pizza Genovese, it's more spongy and uh, chewy. Pugliese is very similar, but with more oil, so it crunch up at the side, and then it's more spongy. And then the pizza Siciliana, the Sicilian style pizza, which is very similar to what it's a New York style pizza or an American style pizza is. You know, with a little bit more tall burger, a little bit more spongy, but not too soggy with different toppings. And uh, what we put on pizza, it's really what we have from the land. You can find the broccoletti, uh, eggplant, uh, classic anchovies, you know, many different kinds of cheese. And we say what it's a pizza capricciosa, that you mix some cured meat, uh, and the egg and the jardiniera and everything and you know the most famous is the pizza margarita that we call the italian flag which was made in naples for the visit of queen margarina di savoia margarita di savoia and uh, they created with to recall the colors of the italian flag which is the green the white and the red so you have the basil leaf for the green the fresh mozzarella or buffalo mozzarella for the white and the fresh tomatoes or crushed tomatoes for the red. And even that, remember, when you say mozzarella in Italy, it's always fresh. We have different kinds. We have the fior di latte, we have the mozzarella, we have the ovoline, the ciliegini, the bufala, can move up to burrata. However, we do not have that the dry mozzarella that it looks like very white paper or a little bit like those uh, styrofoam uh, uh, peanuts. No, that is not mozzarella, okay? That's a processed cheese that has been called pizza cheese or mozzarella in other countries, but it's not what you will find in Italy. And I can assure you, unfortunately, some touristical places, they start to do that, where even here, the clientele has changed they're demanding that quality, which is, uh, according to our standard, not the other way quality, but they'll do that. So that's evolution of the business, and we have to go with it. You know, we like to keep tradition, but I do understand as a businessman, as a chef, as a restaurateur, that we need to evolve, and why certain people do that, 
it is what this is called. So well, we always did too much. Talking about cheese, obviously Italy is a great country of cheese, like France, like Spain, like Greece. I would say like most Mediterranean countries are a great country of cheese. One thing that... <laughs> that uh, you say cheese? Uh, let's talk about... I got some of Fiore Sardo from Sardinia. This is my friend. Oh. I brought this the other day from Sardinia. Now it dried up slightly, so it's but it was a little bit more fresh. And this is... the the sweet pecorino from Sardinia. It's the one called okay. Fiore Sardo. And uh, it is all unpasteurized sheep uh, cheese. So and only... that's another thing that's interesting. When you go and buy the pecorino outside Italy, you will say made with 100% cow milk. It's called pecorino because it's made with pecora milk, okay? From sheep. So make sure you get the right one. Absolutely. There's another cheese i'm not i'm gonna say cheese but that um chef Vinny actually corrected us on um one of our small mistakes that we have made ricotta i learned that ricotta is actually not a cheese it is a dairy product and chef Vinny, maybe you can tell us about it yeah which we call latticino because it's what do you find in commercial and especially outside italy is more of a fluffier area cream cheese alike and all the blogs and uh, networks that tell you homemade ricotta cheese you will make with actual milk so it is not we use what can be translated it's very kind of it, but it's like the whey you know it's we call the siero that you recooked ricotta means recooked and from the the siero the serum the way you know you have the protein of the Latticing that will move up and it becomes this little cloud, the beautiful, that looks almost like the cottage cheese originally. And you just scoop it out, put in your canister and squish together, and then we'll stay together and they're so nice and fluffy and airy. And when the ricotta is done, it will be sold to you warm from the shepherd or the case fisher, the dairy store so it, it comes warm then you have to refrigerate that or will come already made two days old at least in store and it's sealed and uh, and it's uh, cold and then uh, the older the ricotta will get the stickier and drier will be the first one will be extremely fluffy so it will really melt in your mouth and that can be utilized in many many Preparation, you know, it's uh, what it's called uh, usually Prostata della Nonna here in Italy. It's a uh, ricotta and pinoli or ricotta, uh, a chocolate chip uh, prostata, which is uh, a pie translated, but it's not the American style or the British pie. It is uh, made uh, with the pasta frolla or pasta brise here. So it's more uh, thicker and uh, delicious uh, chunk of deliciousness with that uh, ricotta. And the other thing is really can use ricotta in many preparation to stuff uh, pasta. And, you know, last week I went to the shepherd, got the fresh ricotta and everyone said, oh, put that in lasagna. I said, you know, we don't do that here in Italy most of the time because it's too good to go in the lasagna like that and it will not melt the way you want it. So, because they used to that uh, cheese, so but yeah, that is a little bit, and it's so hard to find authentic ricotta outside Italy. I'll say 90% it is not. So, and then if you guys come visit Italy, make sure you buy some authentic ricotta, and even that you will find ricotta di vacca, it's the cow ricotta, ricotta di pecora is the sheep ricotta, you will find the buffalo ricotta. So, and in a very, very uh, amount also got ricotta. Perfect. Thank you so much for all these uh, details. Again, if you have any question um, for Chef Benny on what we have already discussed or anything you wanted to know about Italian cuisine, feel free to uh, post a comment either on Facebook or on YouTube. Another uh, topic I wanted to discuss with you is we talked about meat, uh, but let's talk about cured meats, antipasti, um, which uh, again, uh, Italy is very known for. Um, maybe you have some produce to um, to show us. <laughs> yeah, I got a, some a wild boar uh, sausage, and these are fresh sausage from the butcher. Then 
you just uh, let it dry, light dry on the hair, you know, and this is uh, like uh, a different percentage is uh, pork and wild boar together. It is very difficult to work with wild boar. There's only few hundred percent pure wild boar sausage and a great place to visit for that. It's a small town in Tuscany called Pitigliano and that's the best the wild boar product I have over there, you know. And the Italian cure meat, it's really, it's raw meat that has been cured under salt and spices and garlic and then it dry in the air. But wherever you go from town to town, from region to region, will change a little bit. Northern Italy, in the specific of Emilia Romagna, close to Parma, you know, it's where the Parmigiano and the prosciutto are the best because it's more sweet hair there. So everything aged in a more mild, everything sweeter and more mellow. While you go in a higher mountain, everything will be more dry and salty. If you go to Southern Italy with the Calabrese product, usually because in the past, you know, without refrigeration, proper refrigeration, could spoil quickly the product. They will mix uh, the uh, the chili paste or fresh chili and the finocchiona, the fresh fennel, and all the spice in that. So it's a little bit more spicy. So it'll be more dry salami at the time. And you can find the excellent soppressato calabrese salamino down there everywhere in the United States. Another thing, you know, pepperoni. It is not an Italian sausage. It's an American Italian. It's, it's great. You will not find the pizza in authentic place in Italy. But if you ask for pepperoni, this is it's what you're going to get. Yep. <laughs> okay. And I remember this. Okay. This is an organic pepper from Har Garden. And you don't get all the same size bell pepper like a pepper in the supermarket. All the peppers are a little bit more abloom and they all have form and things around. So that's the thing. It will make a real different. So this is just to give you an idea, or you can find zucchini. This is the zucchini from our garden. Same, you know, it's a little bit more different from the standardized sides, all the colors. As you see, this is the classic Roman zucchini. It's a little bit different green, a little bit more hard external part. And it usually comes with the flower this time of the year and will make the zucchini blossom or the fiori di zucca, as we call, which are great in pasta, deep fried in pastella, Stuffed of, with of mozzarella food. and anchovies, you know. Yeah, I, that's one of my favorite appetizers, actually. I mean, I don't know if it's authentic or not, but here in the US, uh, a lot of times it's filled with ricotta be, before being deep yeah. fried. I know. Is that something yeah. that is done in Italy or? In Italy, it's uh, with the fior di latte. It's yeah. usually with the mozzarella and you do the anchovies to give the saltiness in that and can be light flowered or can be in the butter. So, will what we call the pastella that makes you know fluffy and airy almost like a beignet perfect so again if there's uh, any more question uh we have about um 15 more minutes but if there's any more question for chef benny feel free to ask them on facebook or uh on uh, youtube uh, we'll uh, make sure to uh, to address them any more uh, yeah. produce that you wanted to show us chef benny yeah, I have a little basket here of a few things that you might not see. So this is one of the classic pitch we have here. And this is what we do, especially for the kids. It's uh, what my grandpa used to do. They'll cut this, put on the on the wine, and then just give the pesca with the wine. And you have, this is called the Francesino melon, what is the cantaloupe, and it smells delicious, and when you eat this, when it's ripe and fresh, it tastes like a sweet marsala. It's right, amazing, you know, and we do this one with uh, uh, the prosciutto and melone, you use the raw uh, prosciutto crudo for that. And we still I actually call, right here. I don't know if it's just in France, but we actually call the, the melon uh, alla parma. Um, from the from the region with prosciutto, it's very famous in, in France. Yeah, no, it, it's only there. It's, and then these are some plums. <laughs> and somewhere I had a, a black fig. I can't find it. I don't know if I dropped it before, but I do have this other peach. 
and these are all come from our garden. And another thing I have to use it, you know that this was my first book that won first uh, best book in Italy, second best in the world, but I have something special to show you. I rarely show this. This was my original. Since I was five, six years old, I start to fill this one with all the recipes that I collect and made. So, and there is uh, all the recipes for the years that I start to something make all preparation. Something that you shared with us when we interviewed you a few years ago is, I would say probably like most Italians, uh, when I asked you who your favorite chef was, you mentioned your grandmother. And obviously yeah. that's probably where most Italians start learning uh, cuisine from is from their own uh, grandmothers with all these recipes that for the most part have not been documented. Um, and you just learn, you know, on the spot as, as you go. Um, any, any specific recipe that you remember from, from your grandmother that maybe not, maybe not trendy right now, but is uh, definitely yeah. like a generational recipe. Do you have any examples? And you know, uh, yeah, and you know, like thinking now or you evaluating certain recipe on my grandma or my friend's grandma or somebody else, mama or grandma, you know, certain things will say they were great, other could have been better, but what really triggers us now, when you say a place, uh, it's outstanding, outstanding food, it's the food that trigger a memory. You know, when the first bite, I think, or palate, all the test parts are activated. You know, it's not the actual flavor, the umami of that dish is something that is connected to that smell, to that flavor, to something that happened to you, you know? And I think the best transcription of that situation is from the movie of the Pixar, Ratatouille, when there was the French guy tried the Ratatouille and move to the memories. And that's what trigger, you know, always when someone give me the best uh, compliments at the time of the residence, when I say, oh, this is just like my grandma used to make, or I didn't have this from my grandma's, you know, because we have the memories. And as a kid, you always have uh, beautiful memories, you know? And then I say, you know what? Maybe it wasn't the good sometimes. It just, uh, the ambiance is the time, is the carefree, uh, environment that makes everything taste better. Why, no matter how good the place is, how good the restaurant is, but when say, oh, it's a beautiful location, it's in vacation and everything tastes better, looks better. It's because of that, you know, our neuron endorphin are produced, we are happier, we're carefree, and we just enjoy ourselves better, you know, just like when we were kids. And, uh, you know, as you ask me, or all my friends, our favorite snack when it was four in the afternoon and you go out to play and your mom or grandma call and say, it's pane olio sale, you know, the fresh bread that just cut, so crunchy, spongy, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, dash of salt, sometimes a little bit thick the tomatoes and they just uh, uh, brush the tomatoes in there because it was too valuable to give you a piece of tomatoes in the afternoon because they need that for dinner but you just had the essence and then you eat and say, oh yes, that is great. And that's what I like to do, you know, and one thing I've been doing lately, very different from my previous part of the career, I've been working now uh, educating kids in school in the K-12 system, through the company I work with, you know, and I educate them through the authentic flavors, what's the difference, how to be a balanced diet, and and that's very important because the future is in the kids, you know, and it's up to us to educate them well and see the difference of what they can enjoy or not. And for example, another thing is always one of my favorite memories, just like uh, in the movie Big Night. One time in my restaurant, I had this nice lady from somewhere, I think New Jersey or New York, and asked me if with the risotto, they will come the pasta on the side. And I told her, absolutely not pasta. It's one dish, it's other dish. It's not a starch in Italy. It's your first dish, we call primo. You know, you have your appetizer, you can have multiple appetizer, you have your pasta or soup or risotto, 
And then you have your second dish, it's meat or fish. And then you have your contorno, which is a potato, a vegetable or both, and a salad on the side, if you like salad, and what different kind of salad. Usually we serve the bitter one made with a vicchio or the fresh arugula, which in England they call a rocket, just like uh, the cup became a rocket away from them, the Euro <laughs> cup. And, uh, and that's a different. And then you have uh, the dessert, the fruit after the dessert, and the coffee. And then after the coffee, you can have the Amazza Cafe, the kill the coffee, which can be limoncello, grappa, amaro, something to help you spirit to be digestive. And it doesn't matter if you're working or not, the lunchtime, you always have one with that. You know, uh, I was telling Mike the other day, so when I was 15, I was working an internship at the Shared Hotel. I was working with a the chef there, so Chef Illuminati. You know, you always have a bottle of wine or every station for every of the chef and the sous chef and the chef of the party that you have to try and drink because they say you work better, you know, and that's what I'm missing. And I think I love it. When I was 14 years old with school, we went to visit the Peroni. And 14 years old, they offer us the first beer there to drink. So that is another of the great experience. So it's interesting when you, when, as you were talking about the different um, dishes, what constitutes uh, an Italian meal. I was thinking, you know, we talked a lot about American Italian cuisine as a separate cuisine. My mother is actually, was actually from Tunisia. And as you may know, there's a big Italian instrument in Tunisian cuisine with dishes that have made it across the Mediterranean that sometimes have stayed the same, but sometimes have actually evolved. One of them that I was thinking about as you were talking about desserts is Zabayon. Because Zabayon is, there's one version which is the authentic Italian version, which is extremely different from the Tunisian version, which actually we have a recipe for, uh, for on, the, on the website, which is more of um, an ice cream in our case, in Tunisia. So two different desserts, the, you know, again, a lot of influence from Italy. Botarga is also a very famous Tunisian oh, yeah. um, ingredient that we haven't talked about when we talked about, you know, again, okay. this umami flavor. I love Botarga, but it's an acquired taste and I have tried yeah, to If you it. don't know, Botarga is uh, dry the raw or the fish roll. So, yep. and that can be used, uh, you know, completely dry or self or my, that's very acquired. Sometimes it can be very salty, sometimes it'll be sweeter. And it's great, you know, it's one of those dishes, ingredients that it's really different. And then speaking of Zabayone, you know, there's so many different kinds of it. It's the Roman Zabayone was made with the spice wine and spice since the time of Rome. Then it's the Sicilian Zabayone with the Marsala to arrive to the Tunisian. And one other thing I always say, you know, the famous French parfait, that was actually an ancient Roman dessert was uh, Emperor Nero favorite. It was made with uh, snow from the mountain mixed with uh, honey, syrup, uh, dry fruit and fresh fruit. And the usual will come in a bowl. You know, now parfait always they put on the tall one but the, the trick of the parfait that you mix everything together and you eat in one bite on your spoon. Got it. We have one question oh, yeah. to, to show. So one question from Carmen. What are your thoughts on Grand Padano cheese? I mean, she meant uh, Grana Padano. So Grana you have Padano. the two big one, you know, you have the two big, uh, uh, big brother of cheeses, the Parmigiano Reggiano and the Grana Padano. Parmigiano Reggiano is a little bit more fine grain a little bit more aged and sweeter grana padano it's a little bit grainier and uh, with a little bit more sapidity what do you usually find in restaurant or at home what do you will dust on top of your pasta after you taste that will serve you the grana padano in that one while you will use always the parmigiano reggiano when it's not the pecorino or different kind of cheese in the mantecatura just because uh, it will blend better. It will melt without doing that stringy uh, effect that you don't like. And that will just book up in your fork. Got it. Thank you, Carmen, for, for the question and Chef Benny for, for the answer. If there's any more questions, we have about four, five more minutes uh, left on this live event. Um, feel free to ask them to uh, Chef Benny. It will be a pleasure to, um, to answer them. 
Uh, maybe to um, to end uh, our, our discussion, um, for people who have not visited Italy or maybe are about to visit Italy now that travel restrictions are <laughs> not in effect anymore, if they go to, for one or two weeks, what would be the, the regions or the cities that you would recommend them to visit, especially from a culinary standpoint? Well, restrictions are still in place. They've been lifted. There is a, a lighter restriction. However, you know, it's really up to you. You know, we have the historical cities, we have Rome, we have Firenze, they are full of museum, and you know, Rome is uh, an open space museum. Wherever you look, and in every corner, you find a fountain, a church, or the Roman aqueduct. You know, many don't realize that the most beautiful architecture piece is the Roman aqueduct. Imagine that you through the Roman Empire 2000 years ago, they had aqueducts going from Rome to Eastern Europe to Northern Africa to Spain. So you can see that every way. Now it's mostly in ruins, but it's still beautiful. Then you have Venice, unique in the world, you know, small town, so charming and romantic. And you have the gondola. And you have the canal, you have different ambiance. You have the more fashionable Milan, you know, where the life uh, is beaten. How, how many aperitif, how many apparel spritz you can get before going to work or before going to dinner. And then you have uh, Turin, which is, you know, it's a nice town. They don't get much tourism in Turin, but it's uh, very beautiful. It's uh, You have the mole. Uh, somehow it's also known as the esoteric city in Italy, and there is so much history in there too, but it's more of industrial. Yes, Many yes. compared to, yes. to Detroit, they say, sure, about the industrial part, but as history, as a beautiful, no, it, it is very different. And, more beautiful and in the summer, you know, all the Italian in summer, August is a national vacation month, we always go to the seacoast. Uh, you know, you have the beautiful Sicily, you have Sardinia, which is uh, a nation without a nation, because Sardinia, they have their own language, they have their own land, they've never been conquered. Their cuisine is very ethnic, you know, and there's this beautiful, beautiful sea. It's so warm, it's so clear. It looks like you're in Maldives and you're eating at the trattoria with your grandma. So it's a really blend of history, ancient, uh, and future blend together. And that's what really makes the difference. You know, I always say, go wherever your heart wants to go. I say, don't follow the trend on the fade just because someone said that or a movie said, wherever you go, it will be a great experience. Just take enough time to enjoy yourself and to learn about the land and the cuisine and the wine and the experience. Because sometimes people come only for a weekend or only for a half day, it's not enough time to learn or see on that one. You can do that in the future after you come like 15, 20 times to say, oh, you know what? Let me go for a half afternoon and have a pasta matriciana in downtown Rome. And then I fly back I say, sure, do that. But take the time to enjoy yourself. Absolutely. No, I mean, this is something I would always recommend for any country is just um, you, you won't be able to visit the whole country in one, two, three weeks. You won't do justice, but just try to pick one area or two and just immerse yourself in the in the region with the locals, especially with uh, try to learn. Um, and um, and I would say that not just for Italy, but for for any country. Um, we, we are almost um, uh, coming up on the hour. Again, if there's any other questions, feel free to ask them. But I would want to thank uh, Chef Benny again for not only the participation in this live event, but for your participation in the um, 196 Favors and to you know being part of making 196 Favors what it is today is really a place where you can find authentic traditional recipes and also the history behind those recipes, making sure that we stay true to the um, authentic representation of the recipes, um, which is not always easy to find on the internet because there's a lot of things and, and the contrary, contrary being, uh, being said. So it's not always easy to find uh, authentic representations of the, of the recipes. So thank you again for, for all your work with, uh, with us and making sure that we stay true. We have about 60 uh, six zero Italian recipes on the website so far. So all of them have been validated by Chef Benny. 
and we're coming up with new ones um, as Italian cuisine is obviously a very rich cuisine and we will have a dedicated ebook on Italian cuisine coming up very soon, probably by the end of the year. So uh, stay tuned for that. Again, Forza Italia, um, we uh, congratulate you again for the victory yesterday and uh, we will see you next year in the World Cup. And like I said, I will root for friends this time. Uh, but okay. I think it's a great World Cup. Any, right. uh, any final comments, um, Chef Vinny, before we wrap up? No, it was my pleasure, really. Thank you so much. It was fun from my home, my hometown, talk to you guys. I want to just uh, show you one last, uh, if I can, through the... It's about the sunset time and show you the famous sunset of Rome. I don't know if you guys can see over there and you can i don't know if you can see st peter's so you know we're about 25 minutes straight from st peter's over here so and you can just see all that and the famous roman sunset say goodbye to you guys and thank you for having me here today thanks again to Benny, and thanks for everyone uh, for uh, to everyone for attending this uh, live event uh, we'll see you soon uh, on uh, 196 Favors, and uh, we'll obviously um, <laughs> organize other events like this one. Uh, thanks again, and see you soon on, uh, on another live event. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Ciao. Bye-bye.